This is Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast where we bring Jesus into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. My email address is jason at sportspectrum.com. If you'd like to email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com. Maybe you have some comments on today's show with Sam Acho. Maybe you have some guest ideas for future shows or maybe a topic or something that you want to see us talk about or discuss here on the podcast. That's why I give you my email address directly to me, jason at sportspectrum.com. We are presented today by Ronald Blue Trust. They've been a great partner with us for a while now here on Sports Spectrum's podcast, and they do such a great job providing biblical wisdom and technical expertise to help their clients make wise financial decisions, experiencing clarity and confidence, and leave a lasting legacy. Those two words, clarity and confidence, are so important when it comes to our finances, and Ronald Blue Trust does a great job in doing just that. Check them out at ronblue.com. For all your financial concerns and questions, Ronald Blue Trust, ronblue.com. Today we welcome back to Sports Spectrum and our Sports Spectrum podcast, Sam Acho, longtime NFL linebacker. Sam was selected in the fourth round of the 2011 NFL Draft, 103rd overall out of the University of Texas. He is a Longhorn, along with his brother, Emmanuel Acho. And Sam played for quite a few years in the NFL. He played four seasons with the Arizona Cardinals and then went to Chicago and played four seasons there. Was in training camp with Buffalo in 2019 and then played a little bit with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the end of the 2019 season. Sam is the vice president of the executive committee with the NFL's Players Association. He's also a podcast host. His home team podcast with Samantha Ponder and Steve Carter is a must-listen-to podcast, one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. And now Sam can add the title author to Sam Acho. He is the author of the brand new book, Let the World See You, How to Be Real in a World of Fakes. It releases October 13th. It's available now everywhere books are found or at samachobook.com. And... This conversation with Sam is about as real and transparent a conversation that we've had. Sam is a very thoughtful person. His answers are not just cookie cutter answers. He doesn't just talk to talk. There's a lot of pauses during this conversation because he really stopped and thought about the answers that he wanted to give during our conversation. And it gets really deep, really transparent but we try to keep Jesus at the center of it all. And so I hope you're encouraged by our conversation with Sam Acho. And it's great to have Sam back here joining us today on Sports Spectrum. Take a listen. Sam Acho, what's up, brother? Welcome back to Sports Spectrum. Man, it's so good to be on with you, Jason. It's funny, people don't know this. We were just chopping it up for the last 30 or 45 minutes. Uh, we, we should have just hit record during that part of the conversation, I know, right? <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's good to be on, man. Uh, I've been obviously watching you and admiring you. I'm, I'm glad that we're friends. We got a chance to know each other these last couple years, yeah. whether PAO and you know, all these different things that we've done. So I'm I'm pumped. Do you remember, and I, I'm asking this question, this isn't even in my prep or anything, but the first time that we met, because I had just had Lecrae on the podcast. Uh, and we talked to him and I, I mentioned in my intro, I didn't mention this during the interview with the Cray cause he has a new book too, and a new album. And it's just so many great things he's doing. And I said, the first time I met Lecrae was actually the first time I met you in person. It was in Phoenix, downtown Phoenix at this Super Bowl gathering. I don't even know if I call it a party, right? You were careful. It's not a party. It's a gathering. Do you remember that? Yes. Yes. It was, we called it the Super Bowl Super Friends Party. And so what it was, and I didn't know that was the first time we met, but man, that was so much in fun. person. So in yeah. person. Yeah. Well, what it was, was in 2014, the Super Bowl was in Arizona, was in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm-hmm. And I was playing for the Cardinals at the time. And I, it was, I had a feeling it was going to be going to be my last year in Arizona and the Super Bowl was there and I left throwing parties. So I got with some friends and I said, Hey, what if we could throw this really fun party, but not like the other Super Bowl parties you hear about. We hear about all these parties, like the Maxim party or the Playboy party or whatever. I'm like, no, I want to, I want to be able to go to a place where people aren't asking me for things or taking, like, is, I want to go to a place where I can be amongst my peers yes. who love Jesus, who want to have a good time, but who don't want to go to the Maxim or the Playboy party. And 
And so my friend said, well, let's just create it. And so we did. And so I invited you. We invited Lecrae, invited Jordan Sparks, uh, Trip, well, Tadashi came, yep. all these different people. So pretty much we said, let's get movie stars, uh, millionaires, athletes, and actors and actresses. That was kind of the whole mindset. I and have been to a, a lot of parties. Let me tell you something, Sam. I've been to a lot of ESPN parties and other parties for work. And it was hard to find. I remember walking downtown and it was like this side alley and going up this elevator. And then it was like, oh, this is awesome. Look at this place where we got. It was pretty cool. It was a lot of fun, too. It was perfect for me because I'm not a party guy. And the last thing I really want to do is go to these kind of souped up parties that you just described. I just really wanted to chill and hang out. And that's exactly what it was. And we got to meet some cool people in the process. Yeah. And the whole point was just to get to a place where, because oftentimes that's, any kind of celebrity or anybody with influence or whatever, you're always getting asked for things. You're always getting pulled in different directions. Hey, come show up at my party. We'll pay you to make an appearance. Or you go there and people are asking for your autograph or whatever. Yeah. And I said, what if we could create a space where these people who are always getting asked for things, what if we just gave them something? So we actually set up this space and had some really awesome food, gave, some, gave them some really, really nice woof out of uh, crap, you know, curated gifts and it was just a blast and I, I loved it it was a lot of fun so sam i gotta ask you about this new book first of all you and your bro both have new books within just a few weeks of each other you have a book october 13th let the world see you how to be real in a world of fakes you can see it at the bottom line if you're watching this interview order it at samachobook.com i'm gonna get a lot of promotion for your book sam because i love you brother and i want people to read this and then emmanuel who was on the podcast with you way back i think it was like episode five that we taped an interview together um He's got a book coming out as well in November. So what's this like? You and your bro both putting out books within a few weeks of each other. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's interesting. I, so for me, with my book, I remember, we'll get into it later, but I've been working on it for uh, for some years. Just like, just God's been doing stuff in my heart. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell that story later. But with Emmanuel, it's just been interesting, the rise from the his uncomfortable conversations. And so that rise turned into this book. And so his is coming out on his birthday, which is in, in November. Mine's coming out. October 13th and it's I think it's actually really cool because he and I are very different but I just think it's interesting and awesome and kind of God to be using us in unique ways at this very moment for this specific mm -hmm. time yeah I think it's great and I, I love watching him and his sort of uh I don't want to call it image, but his stature kind of increased certainly and in being on that uncomfortable conversations and watching you and doing the amazing things that you're doing with the book. You got this podcast that you're out, you have out with home team with Sam and Steve. And I love uh, listening to that podcast as well. But let's talk about the book. Um, let the world see you. When we had you on last, I want to let people hear this. It was a year ago in November of 2019. And you were telling us about this book that you were working on. You had just signed a deal, I think, and it was coming out, quote unquote, next year. But we didn't know when next year was. Well, now we know it's here and it's October 13th. Let the world see you. Tell us about the book and uh, what people can expect. Yeah, well, even just taking me back to that moment, we were on the phone and I literally I was a free agent. I had just signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And uh, not, not long before that, I had, had signed this book deal. And so you and I had a phone call and I had been on a flight. I was on, I was on a flight working out with a team. And I remember having the idea of writing a book and, and mentioning it to someone on the plane. Hey, I'm going to write a book. It's going to be great. And I hadn't started writing it at that, like on that flight before we, you and I talked, I hadn't started writing it. Yeah. And, and I mentioned I was writing a book. This lady says to everyone on the plane, Hey, this is Sam. He's writing a book. He's got a book coming out. Hey, what's your book coming out? I'm like, I haven't even, I just, I, I literally just had, it was an idea. And yeah. so from that point on, <laughs> from that point on, I said, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to tell, I'm going to tell as few people as possible that I'm writing it so I can do it. You know, Lil Wayne says real G's move in silence, like lasagna. I was trying to move <laughs> in silence, like yeah. you know, the G. And so we had, we had talked and you're a friend. And so I wanted to tell you about the book, but I said, man, yeah. if I go and tell this podcast, I'm mm -hmm. writing a book, what happens with the question? So so anyways, right around that time, I had just signed with Tampa Bay, and I and this is kind of months after that first flight I told you about. So I just finished the manuscript and sent it in to the publisher. And and the book is about what it means to be, well, better yet, what it's about. Uh, I'll just tell you how it starts. Okay. About that. So the book starts off, 
with a conversation with a friend of mine who who had posted a message on Facebook asking for permission to leave. To 70, leave. To leave. Okay. He was 70 something years old. He was a next door neighbor when I played for the Cardinals. He'd been married for 50 years. He'd been battling cancer, wasn't getting better. He had tried all the treatments, nothing was working. And so he posted on Facebook asking for permission to go. He wanted to go home, wanted to see Jesus. Wow. And <clears throat> funny enough, he had actually reached out to me personally a couple of weeks before, but I was busy. It was in the season. I didn't have time to talk. Yeah. And so I saw them. My wife actually shared the message with me. And so I called him immediately. His name was Jerry. And I said, Jerry, what's going on? And he responded. And you could, you could tell he only had about like 20% of his, his strength left in his voice. And he said, I'm ready to go home. Hmm. So I'm ready to go home. And for me, that never made sense. I never really experienced death before. I hadn't I lost too many friends and didn't know what that really meant. But he said, I'm ready to go home. And so I said, well, shoot, man, like, give me what you got. Give me what you got. I used to always sit in his, sit in his, his office. He had, he had a house next door. So I'd go over and just sit and listen and learn. And he, he and I became friends. My wife and his wife became friends. They had been married for, at that point, 40-something years. And my wife and I had just gotten married four months before. And so he says, <clears throat> I said, give me what you got. Like, what do you have for me? I always used to go to your office and listen. Tell me what you got. And he said, he said, Sam, there's two things I want you to know. He said that these are the two most important things I've learned in my entire 70 plus years on this earth. He said, number one, the most important thing you can do on this earth is to get to know Jesus. He said, he said, get to know Jesus intimately. He said, God takes no greater joy than us getting to know him. And you will get no greater joy than getting to know Jesus. And he paused pause and you pause and i'm sitting there like okay well, i mean that's it as you're dropping bombs like that's number one what's next right what's the what's next and he said sam and the second thing i want you to know i want you to know that you are worth getting to know never forget that you are worth getting to know and those 10 words would be the last words i ever heard from my friend from my mentor we go on to slip into a coma and would pass away a few days later. Actually hopped on a flight in the middle of the season. I left practice. I left, I had an injury, so I left rehab and I got on a flight to try and go see him. And I landed. And by the time I got to his house, he had just passed away a few moments earlier. <clears throat> and um, and that, that those were uh, that was his message that I was worth getting to know. And for whatever reason, I never believed that I was worth getting to know. I thought people wanted to know me. Uh, because I was a football player or because I was a smart guy or put on these masks. And he said, no, Sam, you are worth getting to know. And so this book is anyone who, who goes and buys this book, you're going to understand two things. Number one, you understand what it's like to get to know Jesus and that Jesus already knows you. He already sees you. He already loves you. Hmm. But then secondly, you're going to understand that you are worth getting to know. And my goal and my prayer is that you like me would never forget that. Mm. Man, dude, that is, that's a powerful story. And I can sense how, just how much it means to you, even as you tell it still today, even though I'm sure you've talked about that numerous times um, since that moment. Tell me about the process of writing this book, because I've written two of them and I know it's painful. It's hard. And I think in reading what I've read of your book, you're about as vulnerable and open as you can be. And that's what I tried to do with both the books I wrote. But that's hard for a lot of us to do that, to really unpack everything, to say, here you go. It's all out here. What was that process like for you? Writing this book was the most emotional <laughs> thing I've ever done. Mm. So people who know me, Many people don't know this because I usually put on masks. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I love language and I love words. And I just, I just, I love how you could, how a word can just change things. And even looking at different languages, how, how different words and different languages have their similarities, right? And so, 
for me, I love writing, but this process of writing, it was an emotional journey because what people don't know, and you'll read it once you, once you go get that book, people don't know that before I even started writing this book, I was sitting down with a friend a week before training camp, going into my eighth year in the NFL. I just signed a, a multi-year contract and I, and I finally in my mind had made it. <laughs> in our reality, it was, I was crumbling on the inside. I wasn't doing well emotionally, uh, spiritually, I wasn't doing well. And I was sitting with a friend and I just broke down. Uh, I was like, man, I just need the season to start. You know, I, I, and here's where I broke down, right? Everything that I had been promised when it came to success or looking good or always having all the right answers, everything that I had been promised, if I did all the right things, didn't meet the expectations. Here's what I mean by that. And so I had finally signed, like, in the NFL, like one, it's one thing to make it. It's another thing to, to make it many years. It's another thing to sign a multi-year, multi-million dollar contract, right? And I was never that. I was always the guy who was the league minimum. Hopefully, I can make the team. Hopefully, I can make the roster. Yeah. The year before I signed this, like, I finally made it, right? I'm the guy. And it seemed like the moment I signed that contract, things just started to go downhill. With my marriage, with me, in, me personally, my relationship with my kids, my relationship with my parents, with my friend, it just seemed like things started to go downhill. I'm not saying that money um, hurts you, but I do have a friend who says money is a magnifier. It, magnify, it exposes some weaknesses, um, just like fame. It'll expose weaknesses, doubts, fear. If you, if you were doing great things before you had money or fame, um, those great things will be amplified. If you're doing um, evil, right, your yeah. evil will be exposed. And I was starting to get exposed, <clears throat> my insecurities. And so fast forward, I'm sitting down with one of my friends and I'm in tears because I said, man, I just, I just, I see the season to start. So what do you mean? He's, I said, I need the season to start because then I can get, I can get back focused and I'll be good. And all this temptation and doubt and fear and shit, I just, I'll just be good. Right. I'll be fine. And, I'm, and, and he says, Sam, if, he said, if that's how you feel right now, I'm worried about what happens when, when you retire. Hmm when football ends and as I'm sharing with him, I just start, I start crying. I don't know where the tears came from, but I started to cry and he looked at me and he said, Hey, hey Sam, I look up. He says, he says, it's nice to see you. Hmm. Hmm. It's nice to see you. And I kind of have this perplexed look on my face. What do you mean? It's nice to see me. And he, and he says something to me, he taps me on the shoulder. He says, and who knows? He said, maybe God's writing a book in your life. And you may only be on chapter two. Wow. And I'm sitting there saying, what do you know what I've been through? This is chapter two. What do you understand? He said, I recommend you go start talking to a counselor. There's a guy he had just met with a counselor. Uh, he did a life plan for him. He said, talk to him. It, it could help. So I did. So I started meeting with this counselor and my whole goal was to put my smile back on and just to say, yeah, I'm fine. Let me just get in and get out. I'll be good. And he asked me a question I didn't know how to answer. He said, Sam, what do you do when you get angry? Hmm. Wow. And, and, and think about it. He said, what do you do when you get angry? And I said, well, I, I just, I, I, I try not to get angry. He said, come on, Sam. I'm, what? We all get angry. What do you do when you get angry? And I said, I, I don't get angry everybody gets angry sam what do you do when you get angry and i started to cry mm. i broke down and started to cry and he looks at me with his hand on my on my heart on my on my chest reminds me to breathe and he says it's nice to see you sam <laughs> man yeah and he said and oh by the way get used to hearing that <clears throat> and so uh he recommended that i would start journaling start journaling start listening to music <clears throat> just some ways to just to help to, to just help deal with some of these emotions right this journey and so uh, what i didn't mention is I, met, I went to see that counselor the day we reported a training camp so that morning 
I'm in a counselor's office and I leave his office and I drive down to go to training camp that night. So we report, we go to our meetings, I go to my room and I start writing, listening to music. Hmm. Once again, I'm crying again. Like, where is this emotions coming from? Yeah. Like I've been carrying the weight of all these hiding and I was hiding my emotions or hiding all this stuff. And this guy saying, no, it's time to be seen. And so I go to practice the next day. We run our conditioning test and we finish it and everybody goes inside and they take their showers and everybody, you know, goes to go get lunch and go to the next meeting. We had a little bit of time in between. I'm just sitting there just thinking about what I've been going through and these emotions and everything. And one of my teammates walks in, Nick Williams. He played defensive tackle. He and I are good friends. Yeah. And he looks at me and says, hey, hey, Sam. Sees me slump back in my chair. He says, Sam, you good? And usually I would, I would lie. I'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm just tired. Or, oh, yeah, I've just got some stuff on my mind. And this time after thinking about me starting to just share more of my journey or whatever has been going on, I didn't even know what was going on. I looked at him and I said, I said no, I'm not good. I'm not doing good. And he looked, he looked back, at, back at me and he said, hey, man, let it out. So whatever's going on inside, you got to let it out. I look back and I look left, look right, because I was, wasn't was sure uh, that I wanted to be seen in that moment. It was just him there, and I, and I started crying. Hmm. Started crying. And so it's funny, you, a lot of people who are listening to this, they know how locker rooms are with the you know the country music or rap music or just you know whatever we got going on on the on the speakers and the locker rooms well another teammate walked in Danny Trevathan when I was with the Bears <clears throat> he sees me sitting back tears going on and he immediately goes to the speaker and changes the songs and the songs that he changed it to from whatever we were listening to we changed them to songs about God's love for me hmm songs about his love and his kindness write a song uh, by marvin sapp called he saw the best in me one of the songs right a songs by hill song all these different songs and i start to cry even more and more and what does danny say when he looks at me he says hey sam call me Ach. he said Ach, it's good to see you wow and so that this journey of writing this book is it's been this journey and what I didn't mention this process. So that happened and fast forward, we had some uh, a tumultuous year really for me and my family. My wife had some complications with our, our youngest son. He had just been born and then she had to have an emergency surgery. She had, had blood clots and they didn't know what to do. They had to have an emergency surgery on her. I fast forward, mind you, I mentioned I got the starting spot, multi-year, multi-million dollar contract. We trade for, who's a good friend of mine now, trade for Khalil Mack. So I get benched. Yeah. Three weeks later, I tear my pec. I'm out for the season. A few months after that, I lose Jerry, my friend who died. A few weeks after that, my wife's wallet gets stolen. She was a Nigerian citizen, citizen, so her, her temporary citizenship card got stolen. A few weeks after that, my house floods. Mm. And a few weeks after that, we're actually supposed to go. We're, my wife and I were celebrating our five year anniversary, and I was going to go to South Korea to go speak at this football camp and or speak at this, uh, at this, at, at, the, at the school and do a football camp. And my wife couldn't come. And so I was ready to cancel. She said, no, you should go. You should go. And so I go on this trip. She couldn't come because her, all her information, her passport, green card, everything was gone. And so I'm, I go and I speak, do the football camp. I speak to the school and uh, my friend who lives out in Korea had set up this great night for my wife and I, we we're going to get some time. It was going to be great. And so it's just me and I just, you know, I just go to sleep that night and I wake up in the middle of the night and I wake up and I started writing, hmm. started writing. And, and the thing I started to write about was about, about fear and about shame and about love and about pain and all these different things. And I started writing and flew back to the States and I immediately called up my friend who said, you know, the friend who I was talking to that, that I started breaking down in front of initially. And. I said, hey, uh, his name is Lucas. I said, hey, Lucas, uh, remember that book you were talking about? He said, yeah. I said, well, I think I'm on chapter 12 now. <laughs> if you know anybody, let me know because I'm ready to start writing. So that's that's how the book came about. Wow. <clears throat> Dude, thank you for sharing all of that. Lucas, I think I met him at that 
that party out in you Phoenix, did. right? You did. Yeah. He, he was one of he, Lucas and I, he, uh, he's a, uh, a, a confidant, a dear friend of mine. And he, he helped set up that party was at his, his company he had a, they're one of the sponsors essentially. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so that's Lucas. Quick break from our conversation with Sam Acho to tell you a little bit more about our friends at Ronald Blue Trust. Check them out at ronblue.com. The company's certified financial planning professionals offering comprehensive financial planning and investment management services based on biblical principles to individuals and families across the United States. Those who are beyond the debt problem stage but want to be good stewards of their wealth. They help their clients make wise financial decisions And the important thing here is they want you and I to experience clarity and confidence and leave a lasting legacy when it comes to our finances. They can handle everything from investment management to charitable planning. They also offer custom services such as total cash flow management and personalized tax planning. They can manage all of these matters while you do your thing in whatever job or vocation that you have. Listen, it's COVID-19, it's a pandemic. We're all wondering about our financial future. We all have questions. Ronald Blue Trust is the place to turn. Check them out at ronblue.com for all of your financial cares and needs. ronblue.com. Now back to our conversation with Sam Acho joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. The book is called Let the World See You, How to Be Real in a World of Fakes. So I want to keep talking about the real deep stuff, but there's some fun stories that you share in here too, specifically in chapter two. And I'd love for you to share, you don't have to share the whole entire story. Maybe you can, it might draw people to want to read the rest of it, but it's just awesome. It's titled chilling with the president. And when I saw that, I'm like, all right, that's the first chapter I want to read because I want to hear about Sam Acho hanging with the president. So can you give us a little glimpse on, what took place and you coming to meet one of the presidents and which president was it, by the way? Yeah. Funny enough, it was two. It happened to be president, uh, president Bush and president Clinton. So, nice. and the way I got a chance to meet those presidents was by taking off my mask. And so I got drafted to the Arizona Cardinals and Larry Fitzgerald is, was a, one of the players for the team. And he and I, I didn't really talk to him cause I was a rookie and he was a superstar guy. I didn't really know how to relate. Yeah. Well, my friends, though, would always ask me about him. They said, Sam, you play with Larry Fitzgerald. He's such a great guy. Tell me about him. How is he? How is he? And I never had a good answer because I'd never actually got up in a, and started a conversation with him. I never got mm-hmm. a chance to get to know him. And so finally, one day, I mustered up the courage to go talk to uh, Fitz, as we call him. And, and I told him, I said, hey, Fitz. He looks up at me and says, what's up, Sam? And he, so I'm surprised he knew my name. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I said, people always ask me about you. They tell me that you, know, you you would call into their young life groups or their churches or just talk to random fans. And they, they say you're such a nice guy. And they ask me if you're as nice in person as you seem, whether on the phone or in their little interactions. And he says, well, what do you tell them? And I said, well, I, I don't know what to tell them. I, I don't know if you're as nice as you are. I've never talked to you. Yeah. And he said, well, dude, why don't you get to know me? Take some time and get to know me. And so I did. And so that created a really cool relationship between Fitz and I, me, me taking off my mask and saying, hey, I want to get to know you and meet him getting to know me. And, and one day, halfway through our season, he says, hey, Sam, right after, you know, one, essentially right after one of our practices, he says, hey, I want you to meet some friends of mine. We'll do, and we, I mind you, this is Fitz. I meet some friends of mine. It'll be tomorrow after practice, I'm dressed to impress. I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, cool. Didn't ask any questions, like whatever. And so we, and that, but I'm like, well, what, who is it? And he, he wouldn't tell me. We go, we go to practice. I, I get out, finish practice real quick, shower, change, you know, put on my vest suit, my vest tie, like nice shoes. And I get it, I get in the car and start following him. I'm like, where are we going? So we go to this hotel, we park. I still don't know what's going on. We go inside um, and we go into a room, behind a room, behind a room, go through <laughs> a back curtain, go down some steps. There's another room. And all of a sudden, we're sitting in this space. And I'm like, okay, it's me, it's Fitz, it's the three, two or three other of our teammates. And I'm like, dude, what are we doing? Like, what, what's going on here? And he says, just wait. Well, moments later, the door opens and President Bill Clinton walks in. <laughs> and what I didn't know was, there were, I knew there was an event going on there because there was a ton of people. I didn't know who the keynote speakers were. 
Well, as a vet and President Clinton was one of the speakers alongside President Bush. And mm-hmm. President Clinton and, and Fitz had been friends because they worked together on something called the Starkey Hearing Foundation, getting hearing aids for people all over the world who need who, who can't hear. Yeah. And uh, so we sit at the table and Fitz had gotten to know me and what I do in Nigeria. And apparently President Clinton does work in Nigeria as well. And so uh, I'm going to stop there because anybody else who wants to hear the story, you got to go read the book <laughs> to get it. But anyways, it developed a really cool relationship with me, President Clinton, President Bush. And there's some other cool stuff that happened in that chapter. That I'm going to make I'm going to I'm going to I'm not going to give it away. No, I like it. See, you're you're a seasoned pro because you can't give it all away, but she set it up perfectly. And now the only way people will hear the rest of that story is if they go get the book. Well done, sir. Well done. That's good promotion. I like it. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Sam Acho is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. So the subtitle of your book, it's called Let the World See You, How to Be Real in a World of Fakes. And I'm like, whoa, that's pretty harsh and pretty in your face. But it is an issue that we have, I think, just not just in the way that you explained your story, but for all of us, it's very hard to be real when you go on Instagram and everything looks great, or you talk to people, how you doing? I'm fine. And we don't ever get below the surface. So how have you seen being real among fake? How is it possible to even be real among, as you say, the world of fakes that exist today? Yeah, well, for me, I would always see it, especially not only in NFL locker rooms, but even interactions. You walk into a place, hey, hey, you know, how are you doing? I'm good. It's like, are you really good? Man, how's your day been? Oh, it's been fine. Has it really been fine? Even on social media, you see all these pictures and all these great things. But it's like, man, I know you. I know what you're going through. And so for me, I've always wanted to get past the surface. I've always wanted to get past the surface level conversations or the surface level responses even yeah. even in certain areas, certain atmospheres, specifically in locker rooms, you walk by and somebody walks by and they say, hey, you good, without even waiting for your response. Like, I've noticed that. It's like, hey, what's up, yeah. man? And it's like, I, I, I sometimes I purposely wouldn't even respond to see if they even cared for my response. Are you just saying what's up just to say what's up, right? Yeah. And so I feel like we all walk around just missing each other, right? Missing these moments, missing um, our pain. And even me, like, we all do it. And so for me, I guess I learned the moment where I learned that I wasn't being real in this world full of fakes. I was I was being fake like everyone else was the the day I got released by the Chicago Bears. Mm. And I'll never forget that day. I'd never been released by anybody before. I'm usually it was the guy who always had it all together. And you see the trophies and everything. Right. And. There's a lady named Katie Nagel, who was an administrative assistant to George McCaskey, who's the chairman of the Chicago Bears. And. Katie and I had a good relationship. So I got released by the Bears. And so I, it was kind of out of nowhere. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I went to, I, they called me after uh, after we had just gotten back back from PAO, actually. We just gotten back from the Increase Conference. Yep. And I invited 14 of my teammates. Seven showed up. Seven got baptized. It was amazing. Come back. The next day, I get a call of them getting released. So I go to pick up my stuff from the facility. And I see Katie in the lunchroom. And Katie always, I love Katie. Katie loves me. She's uh, she's a man, Sam, you have such a great smile. She's a, uh, you know, 50 something, 60 something year old woman. And, and so I see Katie, she says, she says, Sam, how are you doing? How are you doing? I say, oh, I'm doing good. Good to see you. It's like, yeah, it's so good to see you as well. Oh man, I always love you. I always have a smile on your face. I was like, oh, thanks so much. I was like, oh, by the way, Katie, I, I just got released by the bear. So I'll be, uh, I'll be heading home soon. And she's like, okay, okay. And she says, wait, wait, what? Hmm. And she, I said, yeah, I just got released. Yeah, I just got released by the bear. So I don't know if I'll see you. And she said, Sam, I didn't even process what you said because you said it with a smile on your face. I thought you were telling me good news. I didn't realize that you got released. I'm devastated. I'm so sorry. And it was at that moment where I realized I have been walking around with these masks all the time, right? It's like the thing. It's like, it's like you know, they got the thing, and then like the like that yeah. was me. Yeah. And with Kate, like that was a devastating moment. And I'm smiling. Yes, I got released. Yes, I lost a loved one. Oh, I lost my job. No, it's like, what have I been doing with my emotions? 
what am I trying to hide? And so that's really, that was the moment where I realized to your question of how do you be real in a world full of fakes? You don't hide your emotions. I'm not saying you go around everywhere and you cry for everybody and you yell and you scream, you get angry. No, but if there are things that are sad, mourn. Mm-hmm. If there are things that aren't going good, talk about it. Share with somebody. Seek wise counselor. Go talk to a counselor. Go talk to a friend. Give somebody a hug. That's one of the biggest things for me, right? Like just hugging a, 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 a brother. Like I need that. Yeah. And so that's that's how you be real. You don't hide your emotions and you talk about things that are really um, hurting you. It's often though people aren't prepared to handle when you open up. I've had that happen. How are you doing? I'm fine. And then I could sense they weren't. I'm saying you don't seem fine. And then everything comes out because somebody actually took the time to ask them how they were really doing. But then in situations that that's happened with me, I'm not always sure if I'm able to handle it and process. Sometimes I just need to listen and like you say, give them a hug or whatever and let them know that I'm here for them. But a lot of people aren't prepared to hear what's really going on. So that's why I think a lot of times they don't, it, you can't get real. And there, there is a world of fakes because they're like, how you doing? I'm good. That's good. And moving on. But what if they say, how you doing? Oh man. Like I think about when I was at ESPN and people would say, what's up? I'd say, Hey, how you doing? I'm good. And I know there was a lot of people going through some, some really heavy stuff. And we never had an opportunity or create an environment there. At least I didn't feel like we could where you could really go deep because we all had jobs that we had to do. But when you did open up, some people weren't prepared on how to handle that because they've never had somebody actually open up to them. Have you seen that? Yeah. Well, I'm personally, I've seen that when I have opened up to people and mind you, you can't just open up to everyone, right? It's not like it's like, hey, the, the lady on the street, how you doing? Oh, I'm more, <laughs> right? You know, right? right. Like, develop Absolutely. relationships, right? All that kind of stuff. But the people who I have opened up in front of, they have embraced me. But I feel like it was some kind of supernatural power that God gave them in that moment. The Bible talks about, um, don't worry about what you have to say in the moment because the spirit of God will give you the words to say. In those moments where I was opening up and showing people the real me, it was almost as if the spirit of God was the one comforting me, not even those people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if these people understand, there's a lady named Jen Gibson, who was a, she's a a team dietitian and uh, nutritionist for the Bears and uh, director of sports science for the Bears as well. And I remember uh, even just conversations with her and other teammates when I actually opened up and they didn't even do, all all that I needed at that moment was a hand on my shoulder saying, hey, I'm here for you. I didn't need a whole counseling session. I didn't need, I just needed, them, I just needed to know that they were there. Uh, there's a tradition. I talk about this in the book. There's a tr- tradition in Jewish culture called sitting Shiva, sitting Shiva. You sit and you, uh, I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. Sitting Shiva. You, you mourn with someone. Mm-hmm. You just sit and you mourn with somebody. You don't even, you go to, if somebody loses a loved one and, or something drastic or dramatic happens, you don't go and say, Hey, tell me more. How you doing? No, you just go and you sit and you listen. Yeah. You're there for them. And I think that's the thing that we got to get better at. That's what I'm hoping to change in our culture. Instead of us rushing by and saying, oh, I'm good, I'm good. No, finding people who you can sit Shiva with, people who can just mourn with you. When I broke my leg in 2013, that's what I had, right? I was, it was my contract year, I, my rookie year. I set the rookie sack record. My second year, I uh, started every game at four sacks, three interceptions, third year, contract year, playing Drew Brees in the Saints, week three, game three, just got a sack at, uh, and beating Ben Watson on a pass rush. I haven't told him this yet, but thank you, Ben. Oh, we got to um, play this clip for him for sure. I know, I know. He probably didn't remember. He's like, bro, I got too many Pro Bowls and whatever. But, um, <laughs> but anyways, I got a sack and I was feeling it. And all of a sudden, the third quarter comes, I break my leg, I'm out for the season. And I had, and obviously that was devastating. And the team had went on to go, they were going to go play Tampa Bay. And I flew back to go to Arizona. And I had some friends, some really good friends who just sat with me. Right. And when I cried, they just were there with me. They came and they brought a tissue. Mm -hmm. And so, no, our emotions aren't meant for the entire world, but there are people in our lives who need to see the freedom that comes from letting the world see you. Sam Acho is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Again, if you're watching this online, you can see on the bottom line there, he's got the new book, Let the World See You, releases October 13th, 2020. You can order the book at Sam Acho Book. 
Dot-com. I'm so excited for you, brother, brother, for this book. It's your first book, and it's going to be awesome, especially you and your bro both releasing books at the same time. I'm buying both of them because I can't wait to read them both. It's going to be great. But 2020 has been a weird year. That's really the, 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 I don't know if it's a hard left turn, but it's, you know, coming in when I last saw you in person, I think you were, you, you were at PAO this year, right? So did I see you at PAO? I wasn't. I, I was I planning didn't. on going and I couldn't yes. go this year. That's yeah, right. So right. it's actually been even longer since I saw you. But the last time I saw a lot of my, really anybody outside of the world of where I live was at the PAO conference, Pro Athletes Outreach Conference, at the end of February. And just two weeks later, leaving San Diego, coming back to, to Connecticut, we're in a pandemic. And just three months after the pandemic, we're in a state in our country that's at least for me, I'm 46. I don't think I can remember a time where racial tensions, social justice has been, at, it's been talked about a lot the last few years, but 2020, it seems to hit a boiling point. And even just recently, as we were recording this and what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and here we go again with discussions and, and, and talks and videos and all of this, I'm really just want to kind of tee you up to kind of share what you're emotions have been what your thoughts have been um you always see things through the lens of christ which i always look to people who can see it through the lens of christ first whatever color you are but being a black man being an nfl player being a dad being a husband what's this been like for you these past few months these last few months have been excruciatingly painful for me and not only for me, but for many Christians, mm -hmm. many African-American men, women who are like me, appalled by the apathy of the church. Hmm. So it's one thing for the injustice of it's one thing for an unarmed black man or woman to get shot. Like that's that alone is traumatizing watching that get shot and get killed. Yeah. See George Floyd, see Breonna Taylor, uh, see uh, um, Ahmaud Arbery. Jacob Blake, as we're recording this conversation, Jacob Blake has been shot and he's paralyzed now. He's still alive. As, as we're recording this. Yeah. That's one thing. Traumatizing. But there's a whole nother side of trauma to see that and then to see your white brothers and sisters, quote unquote, brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, right? We're all following Jesus, supposedly. Um, to see them be so dismissive, apathetic, passive, dilutive, if that's even a word, just to see them just not care. The emotion that it brings me back to was back when I was in the fifth grade. Uh, people who don't, people don't know this, don't know this about me. I went to uh, an all white school, predominantly white school. It was a uh, all boys college prep school, the number one rated school in the United States, number one rated private school. Mm. But I'd also gone to a predominantly black church. So I'd been around both black culture and white culture. Also, my parents are from Nigeria, so been around Nigerian cultures. So I always felt like I didn't really fit in. My church, in the school I went to before, you know, was, was associated with the church. We would learn about you know, African American heroes and history, etc. Why well, switch schools from that, that school that was kind of with the church, right? Black, black school to pretty much a white school. In fifth grade, we watched a movie called Roots, and mind you, we didn't hear about any, any black heroes, didn't hear about Benjamin Banneker, didn't hear about um, uh, Fritz Pollard, didn't hear about any of these people. Um, but one day in the fifth grade, uh, springtime, I believe it was, we watched the movie Roots. Anyone who's seen that movie, it's a movie that actually talks about what happened in American history with slavery and the realities of that. 
we watched that movie and I was traumatized. Number one, because I'm sitting here saying, why has this never been talked about? Hmm. Why am I? Why has this never been talked about? And even after that, it wasn't talked about, right? It's not taught in history books. Like, why is that? But then what was even more traumatic was how dismissive people were of it. Not just the students, but the teachers as well. It's like we had our day or two of watching the movie. It's like, all right, see you guys later. Um, let's move on to, to, you know, to 1876, right? Does nobody care? Hmm. Like, how can you see, see Jacob Blake, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd be shot and your first response is, well, what did he do wrong? Better yet, your first response is, let's wait for the evidence. Better yet, you see, well, hey, look, he had a criminal record. So now that justifies him being shot down and killed by the police or by white people because he was in the wrong neighborhood. How can that be your initial response? We have been taught somewhere along the line in school, in church, we have been taught that Black lives do not matter that Black people do not matter. They are less than. We've been taught that. You can't deny it. Look at any history. Uh, there's a book, I believe, it's called Divided by Faith. It talks about, and another book called uh, Jesus and the Disinherited. And one of those, and both those books are great books I recommend. And it talks about, and um, I believe it was Divided by Faith, how back in, I think it was the late, eight, late uh, 1800s, even early 1900s, um, mid 1900s at church, they would stop the service so people can go do a lynching. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like mid 1900s. Yeah. Do the lynching, come back and continue service. Right? Go to the Museum of the Bible in DC. Uh, there's a Bible uh, called the Negro Bible. And in that Bible that slave owners hold, held, um, they actually would, they took out the pages of Exodus. Mm-hmm. Right? And so we have been taught, you asked what's been most traumatizing for me the hardest time. Uh, my, how am I handling with the, you know these emotions? I'm I am I'm I'm devastated more than anything because Christians. Now I'm not talking about non-believers, but Christians, white Christians, have refused to even acknowledge the plight of their black brothers and sisters. And so that's been the most traumatizing part for me. And my hope, I can't even end with hope right now. Like, I just want to talk about the trauma, right? Because I, I can't get away from this. Nobody, we can't get away from this anymore, right? It's shooting after shooting after shooting, murder after murder. It's not even just the police, Right. It's not a police issue. Right. Look at Ahmaud Arbery. Those weren't police officers. Those were white people in a neighborhood that it wasn't the police, yeah. you know. So and then it's not the police. Not people say, well, Black Lives Matter and political. No, man. Like it's. Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back. As he walked to his car. With his kids in the car. Yes, you may say, well, there could have been a gun in the car. Hey, how about you? Um, if you want to detain him, maybe maybe you um, tase him. Hmm. Oh, well, we did tase him. So you tase him and you shot him. He wasn't being uh, uh, combative, right? Maybe go in and, 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 I mean, I would say try and tackle him. But look at look at George Floyd, right? He had, they had his knee on his neck. Eight minutes, 46 seconds, right? There's some hatred deep, deep down inside a lot of people. And I feel like... Um, God is separating the, what is it, the sheep from the wolves. I think that's what's happening right now. A lot of the people I talk to, um, when George Floyd happened, I, I called your brother. Um, I texted you, uh, called Pastor Brian Loritz um, and had him on the podcast because something was clearly wrong. And there's a lot of people by the way, I'm raising my hand as a white Christian who didn't understand, who didn't allow myself to understand, but sees the pain that my black brothers and sisters 
and specifically, like you said, my black brothers and sisters in Christ are going through. And so I just wanted to learn and to listen, to lament. That was something Brian Loritz shared. I said, what can I do? He's like, sometimes you just got to lament. He talked about sitting in Shiva, I think was what it was called for the Jewish custom. You know, that's kind of what lamenting is a lot of times. It's just sitting and lamenting and, and feeling the pain and having empathy. But I'm most concerned, Sam, because there are people that I know, and I really just want to get your thoughts. Um, I don't know even what the question is, but there are people who I know, very close friends um, and others, not just close friends, but different people who, when they hear you or even me ask you about 2020, they tune it out. You know, I saw someone the other day share something on Instagram and then they shared their follower followers just to kind of prove a point when they were talking about um Jacob Blake and you know they lost like a thousand followers in 12 hours or something and it the point was that there are people out there who do not want to hear this or do not want to who want to put facts and I get facts facts are important the data and all that um but they don't want to hear the pain they just want to show the data and make it go away as, as how I kind of feel like a lot of people have in uh, in different places that I've walked just want to kind of make it go away. And they'll say racism is wrong and, they, and they're right. Obviously it's sin, but they don't want to listen. And I don't know. I just want to get your thoughts because that's for me, that's been the only thing is I feel like we can't talk about this enough. Now there's going to be people who say, well, the black lives matter movement is Marxist and all these other things. And there's hidden agendas and blah, 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 and politics and all that. I'm putting all that aside and just saying, Sam, you're my black brother, but you're my brother in Christ. You're my friend. And I want to listen to you. I want to feel the pain that you're feeling. I want to understand. I want to hear you. But a lot of people don't want to do that. Have you seen that? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, I just believe that if you are following Jesus or claim to follow Jesus or want to follow Jesus, yeah, I feel like we're getting it all wrong. Specifically in the church, I feel like we're getting it all wrong because we are watering down, even when it comes to sex, right? Mm. Bible is clear. Husbands, right? If you, if you, uh, look lustfully upon a woman you've committed adultery in your heart. We want to talk about gay and not gay, but nobody wants to talk about what about the fact that like in the church, it's almost approved. Yeah, you can have sex uh, as much as you want before, without being married. And we'll just kind of set that one aside because it's going to happen anyway. Mm. Like, where is that in, in scripture? Abortion, right? Jesus talks about knitting us, Psalm 139, 14. While you were in your mother's womb, I knitted you. And yeah, people might take a stand for abortion, right? But it's like, you're cool with the black baby, but you're not cool with the black man. Hmm. And you don't even regard a black woman unless she's going to go abort her baby. Then you're going to go provide her some services. So... We've got it all, all, all backwards as Christians. We need to stop. We need to stop, number one. Number two, we need to repent, right? Turn. All that the word repent means is to turn the other way. Yep. And instead of trying to ask, hey, Sam, or a black, black guy, black man, what do I do? Right. Like look inside yourself, man. Like God gave you gifts, abilities, talent, skills, a mind. Use it. Use it's simple. Well, I just don't know what to do. I'm a 40 some year old white guy. Or I'm a 70 year old white. Like you're qualified to be president. You know what I mean? Like if you uh, that's what you look at some of these. I was looking at I think it was Santorum or somebody. People might say it's political, but I'm looking at some of these people. I'm like, bro, how did you even get qualified to be a, a, a presidential nominee? Mm. You know what I mean? Like I'm just because you're white. There it is. You know what I mean? So um, to all the people who are being apathetic, I would just say, stop, stop it. Like apathy is not the answer. Mourn for your 
black brothers and sisters, but also more for yourself. Because if that's where your heart's at, where you just are so passive and dismissive of people being murdered, of black people being murdered, then you've got some major, major issues that you don't even know about. Hmm. As we wind down, um, Sam Acho, and this has been really good. I'm glad we had this conversation. Um, I want to lead into this because a lot of what we just talked about actually led you to act in a very unique way. Uh, and if you follow Sam on Instagram, you saw that he was part of a, a group that bought a liquor store and turned it into a food mart. And I thought, okay, Sam, you're doing some awesome things, but what is this all about? And I knew we were going to have you on the show. So I, I ask you, tell us about that. Why did you do that? And what, would, what was that all about? Yeah, that was in direct response to my pain and my anger and my sadness from seeing George Floyd get shot, uh, get murdered, get suffocated, get kneeled on, um, knelt on. That was in direct response to uh, me driving from Phoenix to Chicago as we were quarantining. I was there doing quarantining and training, whatever you want to call it, um, driving back and seeing all the the not just the looting or the rioting, but the response, the picture that was painted, right? Everyone ignored that George Floyd got killed and they're just saying, well, why would you riot? Why would you loot? That's unacceptable. That's inhumane. Yeah, you don't think uh, a, 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 a white man putting their knee on some, a black man's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds till he dies. You think that's humane? Like that, that I was mourning. I was mourning. And I'm very emotional. Um, emotionally healthy, emotionally intelligent, whatever you want to call it, but I'm emotional. So I wanted to try and channel some of that anger, sadness, that energy somewhere. And so, uh, and that's what I did. And so I, I reached out to some people who I knew from the Bears, from the Bulls, from the Cubs, from the Blackhawks, from the White Sox. I said, hey, let's go do something. Um, I reached out to a nonprofit leader who I knew in the community named Donita Travis. And I said, hey, what do your kids need? She runs a nonprofit called the By the Hand Club for Kids. I said, what do they need from us? If they mentor and serve young kids in the five worst neighborhoods in Chicago. When I say worst neighborhoods that have been forgotten about, neighborhoods that have been disenfranchised, we'll get into that later. Yeah. And so I was like, do y'all need us to, to tweet something out, to go and protest, to go and talk to somebody? What do you need? What do you, we're ready. And she said, honestly, Sam, our kids just need some encouragement. They need somebody to listen to them. And so that's what we did. So I got pro athletes from, uh, all, essentially all the Chicago teams, Jason Hayward, Jason Kimnis from the Cubs, Mitch Trubisky and Allen Robinson from the Bears, Jonathan Taves and Malcolm Subban from the Blackhawks, Ryan Archer Diacono and Max Struess from the Bulls, Tyler Lancaster and Austin Carr, who both went to Northwestern, one place for the Saints, one place for the Packers yep. uh, on that initial day. And then Brittany Payton, who's the daughter of Walter Payton. She came, um, she just had a traumatic experience as well. Um, we all came, we just sat and we listened. We sat and we listened to the kids and, and we, 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 we had police officers there as well. We all sat in circles, listening circles, and we just listened to them. And um, what we heard there, I heard despair. I heard despair. I heard doubt. I heard fear. And after that listening session, we did a tour of that community because we wanted to see what some of the looting everyone was talking about. And we wanted to see it. And so during that tour, yes, we saw looting. Yes, we saw buildings that were boarded up. But what we saw even more so it was more telling was, was what the situation was like outside of the looting on our, with our own eyes, we counted one grocery store and 10 liquor stores on our 30 minute little bus tour around a couple blocks in this neighborhood. Mm. And something about that didn't feel right. Statistics day in that neighborhood. It's, it's, it's a, it's the, the West side of Chicago, the neighborhood called Austin. It is a food desert. Statistics say that there are two grocery stores, and 17 liquor stores within a half mile radius of this neighborhood. No rioting, no looting. That's just that's just how it is in this black neighborhood. That's quote just how it is, right? There are systems that have been put in place to make sure that's how it is. Um, so we said, what if we did something about it to change it? And so we did. And so we recruited a couple more athletes, Lucas Giolito from the White Sox, who just threw a, a no hitter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, who else? A bunch of other guys. Jimmy uh, Jimmy Murray from the Jets. Garrett Dickerson from the Giants, a bunch of other uh, athletes to come together and raise half a million dollars to go and buy this liquor store and turn it into a food mart. And the liquor store is right next door to the buy the hand facility. They've been trying to buy it for 10 years. The 
owner was never going to sell it. He said he wouldn't sell it, um, refused to sell it while all of a sudden COVID hit. COVID hit and uh, his place got eluded as well. And so he was more receptive to buy-in. So we actually gave him an amazing price for it, right? Um, bought it. And then a few weeks later, by God's grace, we opened it up to, uh, to be this food mart, open air, pop-up, fresh food market um, that is now named Austin Harvest. That's now run by the kids in the community. It's managed by the kids in the community. They're getting paid. They get access to healthy food that they didn't have initially. Um, and now there's instead of two liquor stores and 17, excuse me, two grocery stores and 17 liquor stores. Now there's three uh, and 16. So that's what we're, uh, that's what we're about. Hmm. I'm smiling, man. Cause I think that's so great. Austin harvest. And uh, that's just getting out and using your platform. And I, it doesn't mean that you're not still feeling the pain, but you want to do something with that. And uh, I love what you did. And uh, I love you, brother. I'm just glad that you're on the show. Uh, and thanks for joining us. And, People need to go out and get the new book. SamMachoBook.com is the website, and the new book is called Let the World See You, How to Be Real in a World of Fakes. You're one of the realest people I know, man, and I'm so glad that you came on the show today. Thanks, brother. Love you, brother. Great stuff there from my friend Sam Acho, his new book, Let the World See You, How to Be Real in a World of Fakes, releases October 13th. It's available now to pre-order over at samachobook.com or anywhere books are found, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, etc. And do Sam a favor, give him a follow on Instagram or Twitter, or just hit him up and let him know that you heard his story here on Sports Spectrum. You may disagree with some of what Sam said. You may agree with all of what Sam said. Either way, I hope you were encouraged. I hope you could feel Sam's pain, and I hope you could hear how genuine he was being in our conversation. We spent time both before and after the interview talking some more, continuing the conversation off the air. And this is a guy who loves Jesus with all of his heart. He loves people and he's hurting and he wants to do something about it. And his way is to help others and to encourage others and to speak up as well. And so I hope that Sam Acho is someone that you will listen to. Just listen. That's all. Thanks to Sam for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. We also thank our partners and sponsors, Ronald Blue Trust. They are some people you should be listening to as well when it comes to our finances. We all want to be good stewards of the wealth that we have. Ronald Blue Trust can help guide you to make wise financial decisions and experience clarity and confidence and leave a lasting legacy. Check them out at ronblue.com, ronblue.com. We also want to direct you to our website, sportsspectrum.com. That's where all of our content can be found here at the Ministry of Sports Spectrum, the intersection of sports and faith. We try to bring Jesus back into the conversation, and hopefully you've been enjoying a lot of the conversations that we've had. Uh, certainly a vast array of guests, and it's certainly that word spectrum. It seems appropriate for sports spectrum because we've had guests from all over the spectrum of sports athletes, coaches, pastors, authors, all sorts of people. We hope you've been enjoying this podcast. We hope you've been in, uh, interested in the ministry of Sports Spectrum as we try to follow Jesus. We try to make his name known through the work that we're doing, the intersection of sports and faith. Again, our website, sportsspectrum.com. And thank you again for tuning in to today's show. We love you guys, and we'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum. My name's Jason Romano. Have a great rest of your day.